theyeshiva.net. Rabbi Jacobson, again, thank you for volunteering your time and, and being with us today and sharing your words that will no doubt inspire and empower us to be more and to do more. Uh, Rabbi Jacobson, I'm going to pin your video and then the stage is yours. There we go. You could see me and hear me clearly? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So first of all, welcome to all of you who are joining us here from uh, this great community. And uh, thank you so much to my dear friend and colleague, Bayalush, for your kind introduction, your illustrious words, and for inviting me to the community virtually and giving me the privilege of addressing all of you, my dearest friends, brothers and sisters, colleagues, um, constituents, and we're all brothers and sisters, we're all part of one large family, uh, the great community of uh, Rabbi Alush, whose reputation uh, precedes him far and wide beyond the confines of Arizona and the desert into uh, many other communities around the world. Not long ago, I think my brother was by you, right? That's correct, yeah. Not yeah. virtually, yeah. physically. That's right. <laughs> yeah, and, and my virtually brother, too. Simon Jacobson, and he shared with me, he shared with me what a great uh, community it is, what a great time he had, and what a great rabbi and spiritual leader. I'm just shutting the phone so we don't have to get all these uh, messages. <laughs> What a great spiritual rabbi and leader and mentor and teacher, Rabbi Alusha. So I begin with greetings and gratitude to be able to be here with you. And thanks to the rabbi and thanks to all of you. Thanks to the Rebetzin and thanks to the entire community for being here. So as you know, these have been quite extraordinary times in the lives not only of Americans, but all of humanity the world over particularly as coronavirus has been coming to an end and we still don't know when it's coming to an end or how it's coming to an end. Hopefully it is coming to an end. But as this, uh, we're slowly sobering up and uh, getting back to normal on some level to some limited degree. As you know, our great country was overtaken by tremendous unrest over the last days and weeks after the horrific events in Minnesota, George Floyd and uh, everything that came in its aftermath. And uh, in many ways, it was painful for me personally, and I'll be very honest with you why. I was under the impression that the coronavirus would bring a new dawn on all of America and on all of humanity. I felt that the few months that we were all isolated and in quarantine gave us an opportunity to be able to be introspective, to be able to spend more time with ourselves, with our souls, with our minds, with our God, with our loved ones, each person according to their circumstances in life, and we would emerge from it better, wiser, kinder, more blessed, deeper, more authentic, and more loving. I thought that the few months of isolation would be very healthy for us as a society, notwithstanding the tragedies and the illness and the devastation that it has wrought on so many. And we'll never forget that. And our hearts always go out to those who suffered. And I personally have lost mentors, neighbors, friends, relatives during this pandemic. Despite that, and together with that, it was like a wake-up call for me and for so many others I know to be able to really reevaluate our priorities, our lifestyle, our relationships, our marriages, our connections with our families, with our children, perhaps most importantly, how we live our lives on a day-to-day basis. One thing that I think all of us felt to some degree or another is the sheared story of humanity. 
When was the last time that 7.7 billion people were all focusing on exactly the same theme? Everybody was thinking about one thing, Corona. Whether you lived in Baghdad or in Tehran, in Anchorage or in Tokyo, in Johannesburg or in Scottsdale, in Sydney or in New York, in Jerusalem or in Los Angeles, in Moscow or in Brazil. Everybody had the same thoughts on their mind. We discovered that we all breathe the same air. We inhale the same oxygen. And someone sneezes in Wuhan, China, it affects the entire world. Somebody touches a doorknob in Milan, Italy, or in Florence, Italy, and it affects the entire world. We have learned how close we are, how connected we are, how vulnerable we all are, and how we all need each other. It allowed us not to be pompous and arrogant. So I genuinely felt that as we emerge from this, the world will become a much more united place, a much more uh, loving place, a place in which superficial labels and differences don't eclipse our shared humanity and our shared struggle for survival and struggle to enhance our planet and make the world a much better place. Alas, as the pandemic slowed down, as the curve appears to have been flattened to some degree, this emergence of terrible, terrible uh, divisiveness and animosity came to the fore with the death, the sad and tragic, horrific death of Mr. Floyd and the rioting and then the looting night after night after night, it really cast such a uh, dark and sad shadow on our great nation, on our great country, on the black community, on the white community, Jewish community, non-Jewish community, all of us from all ethnic groups, all races, all backgrounds, all persuasion, all persuasions, and all walks of life. And yet, upon deeper thought, we're Jews, we live with hope, we live with optimism, not with naivete, but with hope. Perhaps this too has within it a silver lining and a great opportunity. Not to underestimate for a moment the pain, the injustice, all racism that has to be uprooted, but I want to address a silver lining in all of this. And perhaps, maybe, all of this is an opportunity not to get distracted from the lessons of quarantine, but really to take it one step further. Some of you remember Gladiator. Remember Gladiator? Gladiator is just one film of an example of what Roman culture was like. I mentioned that, but it wasn't very different in Greek culture and in so many other cultures, all the way till pretty close to the present day and age. But the common denominator was that the disregard for human life was incredibly painful. People actually found a person being torn to pieces by a tiger entertaining. They found a slave being slashed by a sword trying to defend himself, entertaining. And then they would either, with their thumbs up or down, determine if he should get a final stab to die. And we're not talking about 20 people, 30 people. We're talking about complete cultures, empires, who came together to gladiators, to, uh, to uh, theaters, to coliseums, to the spectacles in which they observed and gained tremendous pleasure and joy from what they seemed to be theatrical. The Talmud says, fascinating, that in Caesarea, I don't know if any of you have been to Caesarea, Caesarea, have you been there? They have big amphitheaters today, they do concerts there. And those were places where they had gladiators fighting. And the sages say, go there on Shabbos. You're supposed to go there on Shabbat. Why? 
This is what Jews do on Sabbath, sit in gladiators. You know why? They said because often there's going to be an innocent slave there in the gladiator. And the one who's directing it is going to want to hear the cheering of the crowd, up or down. Should he live or shall he die? The more Jews who are there screaming on Sabbath, let him live, you can save a life. And we'll do anything, even desecrate the Shabbos to save a life. The Talmud says that Rabbi Akiva was walking with his colleagues. They were traveling to Rome. They lived in the second century after the common era. And they heard the thundering excitement coming from the capital. Again, it's hard for me to understand, but when you read history or documentaries about Rome, you can imagine tens of thousands of people gathered in these huge stadiums, screaming, cheering for these gladiators to fight. And the, the richness and the wealth and the squandering of money and the aesthetics and the architecture that the emperors conceived was all heard by the sages. And they started to cry. Rabbi Akiva started to laugh. They said, why are you crying? He asked them. They, they asked him, why are you laughing? So he said, why are you crying? He said, how can we not cry? Our holy temple went up in flames. And this nation, the Romans, which did it all, they massacred our people. They decimated our land. They destroyed our temple. They are sitting in such glory. Rabbi Akiva responded and he says, that's why I'm quelling. And I quote the Talmud, Makos 24. If this is the level of excitement that those who transgress his will are fortunate to experience, what type of joy will those who perform God's will be able to experience? Rabbi Kiva says, this is what I'm crying, because this shows me the foretaste. If such false realities can generate such excitement and such joy, imagine the type of joy and experience that comes from a real meaningful relationship with truth, with morality, with God. And the contrast between the two cultures was incredible. While in Rome and other cultures, the focus was on power, 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 power. Human life was completely irrelevant. In Jewish culture, in Judea, the greatest hero was not the warrior who can slash people's throats or crucify them. The greatest warrior were the sages or people of piety who spoke of what God wants from us, of compassion, of virtue, of moral sensitivity, of spiritual scholarship, of the oneness of humanity, of the spirituality of life. And for the Jews to be able to cling to that was incredible. And that's where I see something very powerful in what happened. An African-American was killed a few days ago in Minnesota. No saint, a criminal with a very sad criminal record. And the whole world is alarmed. The whole America is alarmed. People cannot see somebody who doesn't deserve to die, to die. Don't take that for granted. This is a tremendous moment in history when humanity has reached a place where our very beings are horrified by the notion that an image of God, even somebody who did not live according to the highest standards of morality, to put it mildly, and I, will, I am not a politically, correct, uh, <laughs> a politically correct rabbi who will take somebody with a criminal record and turn them into a saint. I don't believe in that. But even a person who has a criminal record doesn't deserve to be choked to death. Justice has to be served. And the fact that so many are alarmed by the Im a human being who's in the image of God, even somebody who sat in prison, who did not do, who, who behaved sometimes in very inappropriate and moral ways, still, death is something else. So this protest, in a way, is an expression of a very deep spiritual moment in humanity, how we have to be able to really respect each other as people. There's also another very important point. 
when the Bible says that man was created in God's image, what does it mean? It first and foremost means that whatever I apply to God, on some level I can apply to a human being. There's a mitzvah to love God. There's a mitzvah to respect God, to be in awe of God. This means there's also a mitzvah to be able to experience love and awe in the presence of every human being. Because if you're in the image of God, that means there's something about you that I can love. And there's something about you that I have to be able to awe, to have real awe and reverence. Even though I don't know you, and I may have some issues with you, I may have some struggles with you, I may have differences of opinion, but there's something in each and every individual who's carved in the image of God that I can discover something to love and something to awe, to be in awe of. And if I don't have the mental space to see it, then it means that I need to work on myself. I have to enhance myself. I have to grow. I have to be introspective. I have to ask myself, what is it that I'm not seeing? This doesn't mean I agree with everything you do. This doesn't mean you're my God and you're a deity and I'm going to worship you. But it does mean that there's something in you that I could love. And there's something in you that I can experience awe in its presence. Because if every person is in the image of God and every person is different, the Mishnah says in Sanhedrin 37, every person is different. This means that every person is a unique manifestation of God's light in this world. Every person is carved in the image of God, but in a unique way. You know that old line, right? The only thing that we're all identical, the only thing that uh, equates all of us, the one thing that we're all similar in is that we're different. That's a, that's, that's a very true statement in Judaism. Because even if our DNA is so closely connected, I also share 50% of DNA with a banana. <laughs> you ever look in the mirror and feel like a banana? I also share 98% of DNA with a chimpanzee, with a gorilla. You ever look in the mirror and say, maybe I'm a, I'm a chimpanzee? That's one of Franz Kafka's stories, you know? Metamorphosis, when he wakes up in the morning and experiences himself as an, in as an insect. Well, I'm not so far. DNA is pretty similar. And between people, certainly. And yet, there is that one little tiny variation between you and I, between me and the banana, between me and the chimpanzee. And that's where my uniqueness in God's image is manifested. And that's why in every person, there's something I can find, which I love and I am in awe of. Just like I'm in love and I'm in awe of God. Because every single person, captures another story of God in this world. 7.7 .7 billion people, everybody can teach me something about God that I did not know myself. You know why? Because of their very being. Because you're in the image of God in your own unique way, and I am in my unique way. And we encounter God in the face of a stranger. So I could learn something about God when I am connected to you that I could not learn from any other person in the world. Just like you could learn something from me that you cannot learn from any other person in the world. We are all indispensable notes in the cosmic symphony that we call civilization and humanity. And this is what humanity is striving towards. This is really the subconscious outrage behind all of this. It also taught me something else that's very profound. And that is the sad situation when there's no spiritual leadership. A lot of messages in the riots, a lot of the messages of the rioters, whether you agree with all of them or you don't agree with all of them, but I look at the lack of leadership in so many communities where instead of people being empowered to make their lives a success story, they're turned into victims. We are forever victims of other people's mistakes. Now, that doesn't mean those mistakes are not real. It's a whole other discussion. Slavery was real, and the suffering of slavery is unbearable. And I'm not discussing right now if the, you know, the levels and vestiges of racism that exist in the American culture. I thank God that I grew up in a home, in a community, which never judged anybody based on the color of their skin. We never, ever learned that based on a person's color of their skin, they're inferior or they're superior. But what all of our brothers and sisters in the black community need more than anything else is to know two things. Number one, each of them is carved in the image of God. So nobody can take away their dignity. Most importantly, they 
cannot take away their dignity from themselves. They're not the victims of anybody else's choices. Despite the difficulties that so many endure, and despite the real, real horrors of hundreds of years ago, that some of their ancestors, or most of their ancestors, all of their ancestors endured, nobody can take away from you your infinite divine power, your infinite dignity. Don't turn your life into a story of victimhood. Turn your life into a story of leadership. It's here where Jews can serve as good friends, mentors, and teachers to all peoples and to all of our brothers and sisters in the black community because we have endured tremendous suffering. But our day of mourning is one day a year, Tisha B'Av. On the 9th of Av, we mourn the Holocaust, we mourn destructions, autodufes, pogroms, inquisitions, massacres, expulsions, genocides, and savage persecution of millennia. One day, we sit on the ground, we put ashes, we, we eat a little eggs with dipped in ashes, some people put ashes on their head, we shut the lights in the sanctuaries, we sit low, we don't wear shoes, and we mourn the horrific sadness of our history. And what do we do the next day? The next day we stand up and we start dancing. Why? Because the greatest gift in life is the gift of resilience. The gift to know that I'm never, ever, ever a victim to any circumstances. I am an ambassador of God. I am an ambassador of love, light, hope, wisdom, healing, depth, truth, and redemption. I am a divine candle lit on the cosmic way. If I could see myself that way, my life changes. If I could see you in that way, I can help you empower yourself so that you in turn can empower others and others and others. These are all powerful messages that are emerging from the pandemic, that are emerging from the riots, and that I think that all of us must internalize not only for our own lives, but to really become ambassadors, representatives to the world and to all of humanity. As Jews, we were chosen to be moral teachers, moral ambassadors, to empower ourselves and the whole world of what we're capable of achieving when we can be here for each other, when we can love each other, when we can have awe for each other, we can respect the image of God in the other, and when we could focus not on our identities as victims, but in our, as our identities as leaders. And when that happens, we can change ourselves and so many others. I say to you, my dearest friends, you may sometimes look at yourself as small individuals tucked away in some corner hiding in Arizona, but nonetheless never underestimate any your influence. Every person has a place that they can impact. I have my corner of the world and you have your corner of the world. Take the bull by its horns. Take the baton of 4,000 years of history. We're coming now from Shavuos. Run with it and bring light and love and hope to yourselves, your families, your communities, all of the Jewish people and all of the world. May we emerge indeed from the coronavirus more wise, more kind, more blessed, more deep, more authentic, and more loving. Thank you very much. Amen. Thank you so much, Rabbi Jacobson. Uh, we hope to take your brilliant lessons to heart. If, if you have a moment, uh, maybe there's room for one or two questions. Yeah? You, I, I know you... Chat. There's a chat here. If anybody wants to chat. Right. Okay. Feel free to uh, either send your questions via chat or maybe unmute yourself and ask it directly. Can I say something? Please, yes. Okay, thank you so ah, much. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you so much, Rabbi. It was very, very inspiring what you had to say. Now, my question is, um, I come from a police officers. I mean, we used to train police officers. Uh, we've trained over 100,000 of them. There are 17,000 police agencies in this country and 800,000 police officers, law enforcement in this country. 
I would say probably 90% are good officers. Why aren't we seeing more of the good police officers? And also I live in Chicago, so you know what's going on in Chicago. So we do address the issue how, and of course every Shabbat when I come to Shul and I see our police officers, I, I just cannot thank them enough. So that's my thought for the day. Thank you for listening. Pleasure. I completely agree with you, and very often, this is another sad component. It's another sad component, and that is that in the rhetoric that's going around, often police officers are given a very, very bad reputation, and it's not fair. There are rotten, rotten apples, no question about it. And rotten apples have to be uprooted and rotten apples have to be challenged and brought to justice. Let's face it, Rabbi Alush can attest. Rabbi Alush, are there any rotten rabbis? Absolutely, more than a few. <laughs> really? Oh. I don't know. Uh, well, you're hearing me now. But yeah, and, and what about doctors? And what about lawyers? In every profession, you're going to have people who are less than let's put it, the ideal of how a human being should behave. In the, I, I, I'm not familiar with the details. I'm not a sociologist, and I don't know exactly the details of what's going on in the police department, but I'm certain that unfortunately and sadly and horrifically, there are policemen who are brutal, who have profound sentiments of racism, who are disrespectful of people, and who violate their power as we have seen. And of course, that's not a question. And every one of us, nobody is above the law and everybody has to be brought to justice. But it also behooves on all of us to show gratitude to the hundreds and thousands of police officers who stand in the front lines of fire, protecting our communities, protecting our schools, protecting our synagogues, protecting innocent people, and often go into difficult neighborhoods. You said you're from Chicago with this tremendous violence, often suffering tremendous casualties. And, you know, to ignore that is not only unfair and unjust, but it's really such an act of ungratefulness. And one really doesn't cancel out the other. You know, I, I, I'm not a fan of this rhetoric that just, that just uh, delegitimizes, you know, all police officers as, as being brutal people when so many of them literally, literally sacrifice their lives daily to protect white and black children, white and black communities. And I think we have to be very sensitive. Does it mean that they're, they're all saints? Of course not. I'm sure there's criminals. I'm sure there's some very cruel people. I'm sure there are people who their own dysfunction, they let out on other people, harming them and using their power in unjust ways. And that has to be dealt with according to the highest standards of the law and in the most serious and concentrated way. So I'm, I'm completely uh, um, in agreement with that. Okay, so Kof, maybe one final question. One final question, ladies and gentlemen, anyone, either via the chat or again, you can unmute yourself and ask it. No? All right. Well, again, Yashakar, thank you so much, Rabbi Jacobson. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to take one question here. Oh, there you go. There's, there's another. Yeah. Your point of view about Floyd is the same as, okay, <laughs> Owens. She even evoked the Jewish people that unlike blame, we elevate the worthy, whereas the black community caters to the lowest common denominator. See, Owen is on Facebook. Yeah, so I saw what she said. And listen, it's very, very important, and I'm going to say this again, and I know not everybody emphasizes this enough, and I disagree with it. The black community has suffered terrible, terrible injustice. What happened during the era of slavery is not just bad, it's horrendous. It destroys a culture, no culture, no families, children ripped away from mothers, from fathers, the rape, the lynching, the beatings, the torture, the delegitimization of every element that we consider precious to humanity. And it's often important to acknowledge it, to understand it, to learn it, to apologize for it, 
and most importantly, to make sure, as we like, as we Jews like saying, never again. However, we don't do justice to the black community when we turn them into eternal victims of and of racism and of bigotry and of prejudice. We don't do them a favor. Just like nobody would do the Jewish people a favor if we would just be turned into eternal victims of anti-Semitism. No, are we victims of anti-Semitism? Yeah. Is Israel a victim of anti-Semitism? Of course. But you know what our main focus has to be? Our main focus has to be to change the world. (laughs) Our main focus has to be to bring light to the world, to take Judaism, and present its ethical values to the world. That's our, that's our function. Do we have to deal with anti-Semitism? Of course we have to deal with anti-Semitism. Do we cry for our past? We cry for our past, but we don't turn it into the defining narrative of our story. The defining narrative of our story is not Egyptian exile. The defining narrative of our story is what? Exodus from Egypt. Sinai, not Egypt. Were we in exile? Yeah. Do we eat bitter herbs? Yeah. <laughs> Do we pour out the wine from the cup? Yes. Do we fast a few times a year? Yes. But our defining narrative is we're heading towards Mashiach. We're heading towards redemption. And that's what I want. We must share this with the black community and say, listen, travesties are, travesties are still done, but you can do better. Teach your children that God expects something from them. Teach your children that looting is not good for them. It's not good for the world. It's not what God wants from them. There's too much goodness and potential in your lives for allowing yourselves to degrade yourselves, notwithstanding the fact that there are white police officers who can behave as criminals. So that's, I think, a very, very uh, important and loving message that all of us can, uh, can share with ourselves and share with our loved ones. Uh, Vicky says, bigotry is a function of other people's insecurity. That's true. Whether it's against people of color or Jews or Muslims, we're all part of the human race, and we should see each other as individuals, not generalizations. Thank you for, for your message. I love Candace Owens. I agree with what the rabbi says. Why did they have to rob Nyman and everything else? Okay, yes, thank you. I'm just looking at the messages here. Thank you very much. My Holocaust survivors, parents and family, we laughed, we celebrated, we loved. I was taught not to hate. Yeah, 100%. I would just add one thing. Bigotry is a function of people's insecurities. That's true. It's also a function of indoctrination. Sometimes people are indoctrinated. And also what happens is, and this is very important, don't real bigotry with fake bigotry. Real bigotry means that I will treat you differently because you are a person of color or you come from a different race. I will really feel no qualms being insensitive, disrespectful, or abusive, and so forth. That's real, real bigotry. And that's what we have to aim at. We have to aim at uprooting the inner bigotry, not the socially, politically correct phraseology, which often means nothing in my world, you know? You could say the nicest thing about Jews, but inside you hate their guts. (laughs) And if a Jew falls into your circles, OMG, oh my God. The most important thing is creating a consciousness of respect, an inner consciousness of, of, of humanness. Another important thing is not to whitewash crime, not to whitewash crime. For example, if there is a community which is producing a disproportionate amount of criminals, that's not about racism. It's about looking what is going on in that community. Racism doesn't mean whitewashing sin and making believe there's no problems. Racism means when I fundamentally disrespect you just because you don't belong to my tribe or my religion or my family, or my race, or my ethnic group, or my culture. That's the issue. It does not mean, like some people say, bearing problems under the rug, making believe they don't exist, because if you say something, you're a racist. You're not a racist. You're identifying a serious, serious problem. Somebody who tells me that all of the terror attacks in recent years, not all, but many terror attacks in recent years have come from the Islamists, from devout 
Muslims who are fundamental. You say, oh, it's racism against Islam. It's not true. It's not racism. There's a problem there. There's a big problem that you have to look at. So I think, you know, the political correctness is often very damaging uh, to our, our spiritual, our spiritual uh, growth and our moral growth. All right. My yeah. dear friends, I love you and I bless you. Thank you, Rabbi Alush, again. You Thank you so much. God bless you and God bless the United States of America. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And uh, right back at you. Thank you so much. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.